So welcome to uh, the Art and Silico Computational Art Show keynote speech um, by Chantal Rodier and Ryan Steck. I'm really happy to have you all here, uh, both virtually and in person. Um, so this is going to be a great talk. Just really excited. Uh, it's been great to get to know Chantal as she's been here for the last few days. We've had many great conversations and um, looking forward to hearing about her work. Uh, just to uh, give you a little bit of order of uh, the show, make sure that you attend on Thursday our awards reception. It starts at 4.30 at the Copper Country Community Arts Center in Hancock. Um, so that'll go from 4.30 to 5.30. Um, you can bid on some of the artwork that's there. I've already gone down and seen the, the artwork and it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, you could go visit during the day too. They're open from, uh, I think, was it 10 to 6? 11 to 6. The president <laughs> is here and she has told me otherwise. Um, and then after the after the the reception at the Copper Country Community Arts Center, we are going to move to the Orpheum Theater, um, where we'll continue the revelry with uh, a bar and pizza and music um, and some more auctioning of items if uh, if there's uh, some hot bids going on, and then we'll also be giving out the awards for uh, first, second, and third. Uh, best in show for the for the art show, which uh, of course uh, come with cash prizes. So we're really excited about that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Chantelle Rodier. She's the STEAM Projects Coordinator and Artist in Residence at University of Ottawa. And as we've learned, an avid scuba diver as well. Um, it's been fun to hear all about uh, sc the scuba diving adventures. And then also Ryan Steck will be joining us virtually um, he's a visual arts professor at University of Ottawa and is also a, a PhD student at Carleton University and is an artistic director at Art, how do I, how do I say that? Art Engine. Art Engine. Of course, exactly what it looks like. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Chantel, take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tim. Let me just move things around so I have a little bit of real estate to work with. So thank you very much. Uh, bonjour, bonsoir. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a place I didn't know, but I'm quickly discovering that people are nice and warm, even if the weather may not be so warm today. And it's getting whiter and whiter. But you know, my flight is just in a few days, so we're OK. So today, uh, as, uh, as Tim mentioned, we will, Orion and I, talk about our work at the University of Ottawa. And uh, <clears throat> we've, uh, we've talked about the title that we wanted to give this, and uh, we wanted to introduce a little bit of the AI discussions that we've been having together, along with uh, a little bit more uh, uh, of our uh, activities. This is the agenda that I'd like to propose, is that uh, I'll give you a little bit of uh, context of the University of Ottawa, just uh, so that you know a little bit where we're coming from. Uh, my STEAM research, the work that I do with uh, Cradle, with the, which is the Canadian Robotics and AI Ethical Design Lab. And uh, Ryan will talk about his work with his students and, and what he's done with AI. And then we'd like to open up uh, the discussion because with these things that like, we always have to decide what to not include. <laughs> so if we don't uh, answer some of the questions you have, please uh, be sure to ask us as we go along. So the University of Ottawa is uh, at the, the capital region of, uh, of Canada, is the largest bilingual university, French and English, in the world. And it's uh, one of four universities in the region. It's surrounded by lots of green spaces and uh, waterways, a bit like Emtech. And uh, it has two water, two rivers and one canal around it. And in the winter, the canal that was just at the door of the campus looks like this. And it's uh, the world's longest skating ring. In, and it's uh, something that people come and visit Ottawa for. So you're all welcome to come next uh, winter. And um, the University of Ottawa in general uh, in 2022 welcomed 42,000 students and 35,000 in undergrad programs and seven in postgrad students. 
And the Faculty of Engineering is about 6,000 people, uh, students in, in 2022, a little bit more now. And um, uh, with uh, 12 programs at the undergrad level and 22. And I said uh, 11 plus one, because uh, I'll talk to you briefly about a new one that we created as a consequence of the work uh, that I've been doing. And um, I'm also uh, working a lot with the arts faculty. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a talk, uh, stats about that. So we have 5,000 5, students in the faculty of arts with 39 disciplines in, divided in three areas, humanities, languages and literature, fine arts and performing arts. And it's divided over 39 undergrad programs and 22 graduate programs. And these two faculties are amongst other faculties as a full university, but those are the two that at the moment I've been more involved in in this teamwork that I do. And has uh, Tim uh, introduced me? I just thought I'd give you a little bit of visuals of my background. So I'm a multidisciplinary STEAM researcher and professor uh, with formal training in, uh, and experience in math and computer science, as well as uh, visual arts and arts management. I'm a V artist in residence at the Faculty of Engineering and a PhD candidate for STEAM research, where I bring artists and engineers to work together. And my research interests really focus on uh, leveraging art and artistic practices within multidisciplinary teams to critically examine today's challenges is really the focus of my research. And um, my STEAM experience or adventure as I like to call it, started in 2017 when actually managing the project of public art installation in and in, in a second one, I, I was uh, exposed to the STEAM STEM, sorry, STEM building construction. And the architects uh, kind of uh, uh, admitted to me that they had um, to cut some budget. Initially there was art supposedly planned, like the 1% art was supposed to be planned for outside and inside the building. And because of budget situation, they had to cut the, the art inside the, the building. So I thought, that's a, maybe an opportunity. And uh, I came knocking on the engineer door, the, the engineer in charge of the project and proposed the idea of bringing um, student created art in the building. And to my great surprise, I, uh, I was very welcome with this idea. And uh, essentially, um, Anand, the person that was in, in charge there, and is still a very dear partner in the in this experience is, well, if you can bring the artists, I'll deal with the engineers. And this is a partnership. This is how the partnership started for us. And um, generally speaking, I my approach has been the same since the beginning. Uh, and this started as a pilot project. We started to introduce me as a, as a client in a, standard engineering design course that existed. And uh, I was getting engineers to think about artistic installation, which I thought would be a bit of a challenge, but it turned out to be uh, very welcome. And, and surprisingly, uh, students were very open. And you see here, like the teams that uh, followed this, uh, which are half engineers and half artists. And I'll talk to you a bit more about this. So. Typically, I want the projects to be project-based learning environments where students really um, are matched with the community partner. The first installation was, the first instance of this was, I was a community partner, but every time that we uh, issue this course again, we have different community partners for, for it. And um, we also want to always have them deal with real life environments or problems that they have to solve. In this case, you see one biologist that wanted to be part of it, and she was only engineers and, and artists part of the group, but she really wanted to be part of this. And they uh, asked her to sample the waterways around and explore the type of light that was in the water. And that became an inspiration for the visual of the final piece. So just so uh, you know how that worked. And uh, to go back to the types of 
principles that I apply for the STEAM courses and the STEAM projects is I, I use artistic informed practices and other methods like what you see here, regular group critique. Uh, and we use this uh, within the team. So the technical folks and the artistic folks as well as uh, external guests would come and critique the work, either external engineers or external artists. And they were all present and participating in the same critique at the same time. And that's an element that I find quite important. And we also really focus on experiential learning and situated learning to make sure that they can evolve within uh, the setup that we create and build a community of practice with professionals as well as students so that they can really have information transfer uh, formally and informally between themselves. And all of this, in my view, is to create uh, innovative solution and achieve transdisciplinary knowledge creation. And this is just to show you what the result of the first edition of our um, STEAM experience was going from the prototype that you see on the left of uh, as a prototype that was produced by engineers only in the course within the uh, uh, one semester course. And after a summer internship of matching engineers with artists, this was the result. So this is one of the two installations. This one is called Equilibrium. And their thinking was to encourage people to go and take the stairs as opposed to the elevators to, uh, to activate the, the installation, which is of course computer driven and all of this with sensors and all. And the second uh, installation called Surface Tension and that you saw the visuals was really based on the cool contraption that the engineers had designed with actuators going back and forth and, and motors and computer control, but they didn't know what to do with it. But with the, with the artists, they came up with this really cool setup of emulating the waves on the water with the visuals in it and you know everything very co coherently uh, matching the concepts. And I think through this, the engineers really learned that doing something cool is cool, but doing something cool that has meaning is even cooler, <laughs> which really they, they got through, you know, the partnership with the artists. And just to show you, it's, it's computer control. There's like a number of different uh, uh, microcomputers in there and, and uh, a camera to, to see motion capture as well. The, the movement you see here is pre-programmed, but there's also an interactive program, uh, interactive mode to follow the person in front of, of the camera. So as far as we are concerned or were concerned at the time, this pilot project was very successful. It attracted a lot of attention at the, at the university. It just happened to coincide, well, it just didn't happen to be, we made it <laughs> so that it would coincide with the opening of the building. So these two installations are still today installed in this new STEM building. And uh, it's uh, yeah, it created a lot of buzz uh, throughout the university. And just a little aside, I manage projects that were 15 times more expensive than, than this on campus to do, uh, to do a public art installation. And they never got like even a percent, 1% of the visibility that this, these projects got. So that was a, a real success. So really out of this, uh, I started really uh, my research on STEAM in terms of really focusing on the development of conceptual and methodological frameworks and tools really to empower multidisciplinary STEAM teams to achieve transdisciplinary knowledge. And uh, the reason why uh, we, I aim for this is really it's, uh, it's in, in the objective to create responsible and meaningful innovative solutions to complex problems that we face today and uh, that I'm convinced will lead to societal changes um, and things that you can't do in, a, in one individual discipline that you have to bring multiple disciplines together. 
And I'm just going to show you some of the, you know, few, the, the versions of outputs of, of subsequent uh, courses that uh, were involving uh, engineers and, and students from arts. And it continues, like, we always pose a slightly different problem to them and hoping that they will be creative and come up with different solutions. So really transdisciplinary work is my aim, is I want to find the secret sauce to, to make it happen every time, even though there's so many different parameters, it's a bit tricky. But one key, key uh, element is really to have a team of equal collaborators. And I'm convinced that artists are, are uh, an essential component of many of these uh, teams that uh, can create really new and new ways of knowing, new ways of doing, and new ways of being together. So wanting to um, to take what I've done in class and see how that really holds when you get out of the classroom, I join a, a research lab called Cradle, and it's the Canadian Research, Canadian Robotics and AI Ethical Design Lab, which also had a multidisciplinary angle to it. It really is a lab that looks at the intersection of engineering practices, law and policy making, hoping to change law and policy make uh, policies, and uh, using applied ethics and now that I'm part of it, art as well. And uh, to introduce the concept of STEAM, I created a, 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 the Cradle Collective, really to engage the power of the arts in the process of critically interrogating uh, robotics, AI, and engineering the design. So to see if that would work, if there was a you know valid way of approaching the projects within this context of a, of a research lab. We created a pilot and um, the pilot was um, to include these beautiful people to be the initial uh, cradle collective that worked on, on the pilot. So we had here Sarah, visual artist and student creator of photo-based media we have William, a philosopher and visual artist, student creator of digital media. Jason, who is actually the director of the, the lab, an engineer and ethicist, a professor of ethics and robotics and AI. Myself as a STEAM facilitator, a visual artist, arts manager and professor, and two additional students to work on admin and, and communication elements. And um, yeah, the pilot project was using STEAM as an approach, and also in the spirit of research creation methodology, the uh, Cradle STEAM Collective piloted two projects to interrog interrogate the impact of AI on society and demonstrate the role of arts and humanities in responsible innovation. And um, just a little bit more about the methodology and the, the objectives that we were shooting for is to really follow and trust the creative process in this in this approach, rather than focusing on final product. Uh, to use artistic expression uh, was determined as a mode of inquiry, as well as an outcome. Uh, in this case, even though, generally speaking, I consider and we consider that uh, a creative output or a final product as a creative element or artifact is not necessarily the output that we want for STEAM necessarily. It can be, but it could be other things like a program, it could be uh, a law, or it could be a, a policy of some sort, so it doesn't have to be a, a creative output or artistic output, I should say. Um, uh, yeah, so in this case, we said that the medium that we use and the final form was really left completely open and, and was a result of the process as opposed to an objective of uh, a, a set outcome. And um, we use interactive uh, object-based inquiry approach and critical making, holding weekly critiques and group discussions to share, comment on, and challenge creative ideas as they evolve. 
So our conversation aimed to challenge each other in each other's respective disciplines and, uh, and respective also discipline assumptions. Um, so the team really remembered, the team members were encouraged to bring their disciplinary backgrounds and expertise to bear in the process and in a very open and safe collaborative environment uh, to help shape our common understanding in the resulting outputs. So generally speaking, the tools that we used for this were, we're still in the pandemic mode. So it was all tools that we could use remotely. So Mural was used to share visual, is a shared visual platform. And we use it to, to collect information, to visually share results of research, uh, to explore research paths, as well as establish connections between concepts and prototype ideas. It was, uh, uh, it's a pretty cool uh, software that is very flexible. We also use divergent thinking and brainstorming techniques uh, all through the, the, uh, the process. And we co-created with uh, gen uh, generative AI and the tools specifically, or some of the tools that we use was Google Assistant and others. And it was just to say, it was before the big chat GPT wave. So we were doing this before all this buzz came, but uh, our project got a lot of attention because it, it just happened to be a good training as well. So this was the result that's a you know kind of traditional uh, art installation where we mimic the sort of the 19, 1990s kind of look and feel of a time where you know technology was promising to be solving all the different issues that we had. Uh, in reality, it didn't quite do that. And we called it, uh, I'm honored to serve because we essentially interviewed this AI assistant for uh, a job <laughs> and to realize that it was pretty shallow in terms of knowledge and in terms of capabilities that it could provide, but very well designed to fool us into thinking that it was more capable than it actually was. And doing some research, we realized that there were actually quite a bit of design and professionals uh, to um, develop a, a personality for this AI assistant. They even like had where the, the assistant had gone to school, what kind of personality they had. Um, so it was very well designed, like uh, you would design a character for a movie. So it was interesting to see that um, with the omnipresence of AI, we are kind of becoming somewhat complacent about uh, volunteering our labor to something like this or our personal data in exchange for free tools or free functionality. And that's kind of what we wanted to bring out in this. And that's the, the sort of the objective of the installation. And again, I was talking about this, like, to expose also the level of design to get you to give this free information without really officially asking for it. Um, so yeah, our, our objective here was really to use art as a critical medium for exploring the limitations of AI and the assumptions that are not always uh, visible. So make the the invisible a bit more visible to, uh, to the, the people visiting the installation. So we consider this, all oh, this, I think we don't have sign, sound, but we use uh, also AI to, you know, convert, uh, to get animated, to get this bit, sorry, sorry, to get this uh, avatar animated with the speech that came out of the, the interaction with uh, AI assistant. I think we don't have sound, but you can. Okay. Up. We do. Well, that's good. <laughs> I thought we didn't. So all, all the tools that we use are all AI generated, generative AI to get the lips to move according to text. Quite fascinating to see what she answers, really, but uh, sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. 
but it's still kind of nice and playful. So you kind of forget about the fact that it's not very capable. So uh, overall, we consider that this was a very successful uh, project and we want to do more. And uh, just some of the key uh, highlights and key insights that we gained through this um, is uh, first is that uh, operating on an equal footing was really key for us. Key from a discipline level, key from an output type level. It could have been a program, it could have been any other output as well. Uh, key from a status prof versus students, like there were no hierarchy at play in the, in the group, no really designated thought leader in the group as well. Like everyone had equal leadership in terms of the thinking. And uh, yeah, generally speaking, no hierarchy at play. Uh, the creation also of a safe space for collaboration is key. Yeah, it was key in this one, but it's key in any STEAM type of work uh, where trust is really a key to success in a collaboration like this, creating a safe space for non-judgmental -jud idea exchanges, very important, and where all ideas are discussed fairly and critically. Uh, the resulting STEAM authorship is also shared the idea of um, the ideas that we came to really could not be traced back to just one single individual because uh, uh, we all came to them together. So shared authorship also meant that there is much less pressure uh, on a single individual to come up with an amazing kind of groundbreaking idea on their own. Uh, as we saw regularly through our exchanges is that a single kind of standardish idea could become very uh, uh, critical and interesting as they were transformed through the interaction with the group. And uh, that was, uh, it's kind of relieves and it actually facilitates uh, idea exchanges as well. Radical openness and few constraints was also a very key successful uh, component for this project. Uh, in this project, we purposely set few constraints, only constraints of time and budget, uh, to let the creative process really guide the exploration paths and the outcomes. So we didn't have that preset. Um, learning by doing without judgment was also something we considered important. Uh, we prototype ideas without pressure of expectation of the final product. Uh, our schedule allowed for ample time to play and uh, to play with ideas. And the contribution came in different forms according to the individual's background. And that was also uh, welcome. And finally, critical making to engage in our critical discussions and shared our ideas through a multitude of media and techniques, prototyping, mind mapping, uh, image collecting, image making, reference collecting, writing, and so on. An idea of initially niche within a, a discipline could actually rapidly become a transdisciplinary idea as a result of the group interactions and discussions. So the, these were kind of our findings. So where are we going with this? We want to do more. We want to do more of, of this. We have a national grant application that we'll find out in a month or so if we have it. And it's uh, uh, with different players in, in Canada, across the country, uh, that we want to push this idea further and see where that goes. So overall, the result of our pilot uh, research was very successful in my view, and it transformed not only uh, the people involved, but also the understanding that STEAM is a powerful tool for this, and that uh, we can transcend the traditional disciplinary boundaries to produce new types of expertise and knowledge. And uh, it also proved to us uh, the value of using art, STEAM, and research creation to critically examine the rapidly evolving world of generative AI, and in this case, in technology in general. So this is pretty much our conclusion of the STEAM activities that we have going on at ROU, and it's ongoing. So at this point, I would pass the baton to Ryan if he's there. He is here. I'm Yay, good. It worked out. <laughs> and Ryan, I didn't get your slides, so you just have to share your screen if you want to introduce your slides. 
Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I have a whole. You can just put me full screen, and I'll uh, I'll take care of Perfect. all that. Uh, my slides are here, so uh, so it'll. I don't know when it works. You know when timing works. Thank you. You're on the screen, right? Great. Great. Looking good. <laughs> Great. Hi, hi. Um, yes, uh, my name is uh, Ryan Steck. Um, I am uh, a professor at the University of Ottawa in the Visual Arts Department. Um, but I'm also um, the co-director of, um, of Art Engine, uh, which is a small nonprofit here in Ottawa. Uh, I've been working in the intersection of art and technology for about 20 years or so. Um, so um, what I'm going to do is um, I will uh, I'll introduce a little bit of the, I think I have the idea, so I'll spend about maybe, I think it's a, it's a bit of an excerpt um, from an introductory lecture to one of my courses, which is, uh, helps, I think, explain um, one of the core concepts that uh, a lot of the studios uh, expand out from. Uh, so it, uh, this concept of uh, the technical image and the technological imagination. Uh, so the uh, I'll spend a little bit of time about that, maybe read uh, and sort of paraphrase some of uh, some of my lecture notes from that. Uh, and then I'll go into the work um, of the studio uh, that we um, uh, that we uh, we just finished in the fall and some of the students presented earlier today. So I'll talk a little bit about what happened in that studio and 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 how I think it plays into this notion. Uh, so the 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 idea of the technical uh, the technological imagination for me uh, is really central to a lot of the studio work that we are uh, doing, um, and I, I think um, while I work at the intersection of art and technology, um, particularly in some of our foundational courses with the artists, um, the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Ottawa is um, it's a small small department. Um, and we are working um, heavily invested in material culture. You know, there's uh, painting, uh, drawing, sculpture. We have a large wood shop. We have large painting studios. Um, we are um, uh, significantly invested in those domains. Uh, and so I teach a lot of students who have um, some of that, that uh, a lot of that background. And so uh, it's not, in my case, about uh, necessarily teaching them to be coders or to, to, to find and, and focus on and follow, um, but to recognize the role that technology plays uh, in shaping their, their whole way of understanding the world and how to then um, be an artist within that context. So, um, so the, techno the technological image is sort of a, a, a concept that's coming from uh, Willem Flusser. Um, and one of the things that uh, basically he's um, posting an idea that, or positing an idea that um, we have the image and its relationship to, um, to understanding of the world. So we're talking about, you know, really, really ancient idea that the image is coming uh, as a way of understanding the world and representing the world. That text after that is sort of the next big chapter in which text, um, and along with text, things like history, uh, text shapes our understanding of the world in a certain way. And we're in a new kind of era, or at least these things are, there's a new element that is or quantifiably and qualitatively different than the image and the text. These ways of seeing the world uh, the technical image is a whole other thing, um, and it is made up of text, um, and we're seeing an image, um, and that image is not just the surface, um, but is really representative of a whole uh, technological system behind it. So uh, one of the, this is the part um, from my uh, introductory uh, lecture where I think the map um, is a concept that really helps understand 
uh, the, the technical image, or it, it illustrates it very, very well. And so, you know, what is a map, <laughs> um, right? The map is a technical image, and this seems, you know, if you stop and think about it, it kind of makes sense. Um, and if we think about what a map is, um, the author, uh, Dennis Wood, is a really excellent geographer, and in one of his books, uh, Rethinking the Power of Maps, um, talks about uh, the emergence of the map as we know it, um, really in about 1500s. Um, so, you know, that's not a happenstance that that is around uh, some of the, let's say, um, the, the voracious uh, pace at which uh, colonialism is accelerating. Uh, but representations before this time are really, uh, they're certainly spatial representations of the world, but they're not the same as the map. Uh, maps, as we come to know them, emerge with the modern state. Um, and then in the West, this is about 1500. In China, it's, it's, it's probably actually earlier. Uh, and part of what shifts between these eras is that the image of the world moves from the space of representing the world to making an argument about how the world should be. So um, this is what a map is. It's an argument about the way the world should be. Uh, not a representation of how the world is. Uh, so the phrase, the map is not the territory, which you've, many of you have probably heard, is meant to remind us that representations of reality, so maps, uh, are not the same as reality, the territory. Um, they are abstractions and should be handled as such. However, when it comes to mapping and the modern world, Woods uh, argues that the map is equally important as an image that brings the territory into being. In other words, the map makes the territory. So, um, for example, the map that defines the school districts and transportation catchment areas in a city uh, defined where you went to school. Right? These lines that encircled residential areas and defined the relationships to the physical school in the city, um, then as a result of this, a whole set of social, political, and economic relations come into being. Right? So from bus routes, traffic congestion, voting in elections, to who you became friends with in high school. Uh, all of this is sort of defined by the map, or at least uh, generated by the map. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's not just, and as you know, everybody I think would be uh, on board with this, it's not one person who draws a map, except for that uh, Robert Munch book where there's a guy in the deep bowels where he's drawing the map. But in uh, the majority of the context, uh, it's not one person, there's a whole, uh, system. The map is a surfacing of a wide array of social and political apparatuses. So uh, we can dig even further into this and consider how the map became the geographic information systems that we know of today. Uh, whoops, <laughs> that's very green. Uh, sorry, I've got a little bit of an effect on there from something else. It's, it's a regular Google map, just greened up. Um, so the geographic information system is no longer a single two-dimensional object, but a constantly shifting array of technological processes. So think of Google Apps, uh, the Google Maps in your phone, um, or better yet, the Google-owned property Waze. Waze is prioritized for driving. It is a technological system that supports your perception of the territory as a space for driving. So. Uh, it accumulates data from city maps, the global positioning system operated by the US military, satellite imagery, weather data, real-time surveillance of other app users, and it organizes it into a legible surface for you to interact with. So maps are interesting because they are technical images uh, with a rather significant popular visibility. Um, and, uh, and, a, and an everyday use, tons of everyday use. We can't live without a map app on our phone generally now. Um, so, but there's this other space of say counter mapping, which I think is really, really important and, and draws attention to the map as an argument for the way the world should be. Uh, so here, um, what you're looking at uh, is the, the, the map nativeland.ca, which if you've never been there is a really incredible counter map. 
Uh, it doesn't uh, have the borders uh, that have developed by the colonial systems brought over from Europe. Instead, it looks at national boundaries, linguistic groups, and treaties from an indigenous perspective. So this uh, geographic device is really uh, a sort of an incredibly powerful view of the territory um, and a layer that's emitted from most mapping systems, right? You won't generally find on a Google map um, what is the indigenous language that is spoken in the territory that you occupy. Um, so that this is helps elucidate really how this technical image, the technical image of the map um, is more than just a representation. It's more than just um, uh, a, an attempt to represent the way the world is, but really a truly powerful system that is shaping the world around us. Um, so what does this mean for art and the imagination? Uh, so keep in your mind the structure of maps as surface expressions of complex systems and consider the other surfaces where images are found. YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok may be the most obvious and useful place to look. Instagram does not exist to give meaning to your life um, or represent the world. Instagram, in fact, doesn't really care about you. Um, Instagram seeks primarily to reproduce itself. Sometimes, um, Sometimes while we're there making and experiencing images, it is a space of joy and laughter. Sometimes and it's an, an amazing shopping mall. Uh, sometimes it brings us together and sometimes it is full of darkness and it pulls us apart. But the structure of the system, be it Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, or whatever, um, might come after that. They primarily want to reproduce themselves. They are primarily technical systems that desire more and more of everything, more users, more data, uh, more. Um, and so um, I won't, this part of the lecture goes into much more sort of bleaker areas before trying to pull it out again back towards the technological imagination. Um, but, and I, I want to just uh, try and jump over to this uh, technological imagination component so we can get to some of the studio work. So that basically um, what is being argued, I think, by Flusser and by others, um, that once we understand uh, and maybe accept the notion of the technical image and recognize it as this thing that's out in the world, the technological imagination is one that is um, qualitatively different than uh, the other kinds of imagination in which we bring images or text into the world. Um, partly because the systems are so complex um, and partly because it is no longer just um, a surface in which we are speaking of, like in the, in the, in the time of an image. Um, certainly there is a surface, um, but this, uh, in order to sort of practice one's, or develop one's technological imagination, one has to be mindful um, of these two things, uh, of both the image and the system behind it. Um, so, you know, one of the, uh, in the lecture, I arrive at a place where I actually use the matrix uh, and uh, Keanu Reeves's penultimate moment in the original film, where he is able to um, both see the system and both see the reality of the computer system and the, the synthetic world as both equally. He can hold both of these things. And that ability to manipulate and play in that space gives him the ability to transform the system and the technical image uh, of the world that is implanted in his brain. Uh, so that uh, being said about, um, about the, the technical image and the technical imagination and what we're trying to do in these courses, trying to get them to uh, not only simply experience um, creation, but to understand how and push back and find the limits of the system in which they are creating within in order to um, understand it and sometimes be at play in it, sometimes break it, uh, and sometimes uh, just make one uh, fun, wonderful, fun things. Uh, so this uh, studio that I uh, ran in the fall um, was called uh, Synthetic Imagination. And um, in the studio, basically, you know, it's been a heck of a couple of years uh, for, um, for AI in the world and all of these different types of uh, modeling approaches. 
and um, a lot of anxiety within uh, the, the artist's uh, community and these uh, young students in the undergrad program. Uh, so I thought uh, it was an important moment for us to kind of create a frame in which the students had the opportunity to experiment with um, and get involved in uh, and find out like either dispel fears or get excited about and start to uh, play with the tools that were that were there. Uh, so we went through a very simple um, uh, sort of uh, structure as we do uh, in studios. Uh, many of my studios are structured with um, some either some technical sort of exercise based work in the early parts of it. Uh, and then as much open runway for them to uh, create projects of their own definition as possible. Uh, so in our case, um, and then we, we usually, uh, we mix that alongside uh, extensive discussions and, um, you know, sort of breaking apart ideas and, and, and going over the work. In this case, I'd had four simple components. I just wanted them to explore uh, synthetic voice models, synthetic text, generative text models, generative image models, and generative video. And they did that in a week long, uh, each one just a week turnover, find the tool. We, we shared the tools, choose a tool, uh, see what you can do with it in a week, uh, and share those sketches together, and then move on to a, to a major project. Um, so I'll talk a bit about some of the projects that were done and maybe give some insight into how the artists think, think about that um, process. So uh, the one that's playing here as the first one looping um, is uh, actually a, the work in progress. Um, and I, don't, I, was, I was told I don't think there's much overlap between what we were speaking in the afternoon. So hopefully this, uh, uh, for those of you who might've seen it, I hope it's not repeating uh, too much. But basically, this, uh, this is uh, uh, a student was trying to make a work that was basically a pirate film about gay pirates um, and a love story between two gay pirates. Uh, and the quick discovery was that they were unable to get men to kiss on any of the generative systems. So what you're seeing here is a loop. Uh, and then it's written uh, two men with lips touching, one with red hair and the other with black hair in the background gray sky. So they had to, uh, in their effort to tell this uh, gay pirate story, um, the systems refused to uh, basically show romantic love between two men. Uh, and it was an interesting discussion. We have a discord for, for the class as well. So lots of back and forth and, you know, trying to figure out why. And then trying to help the student figure out ways around the prompting system to actually bring these men together. But uh, as we mentioned this afternoon, kissing is such a particular human uh, thing that it's a really hard one to kind of get around. It's no like it's not two people walking on a beach that maybe you can create an ambiguous interpretation. It's really a very distinct physical act um, that they could not get represented. They tried in all kinds of ways uh, and you could not really get uh, two male presenting figures to embrace. Um, so that, you know, they, in, in the end, what's interesting about that one, I find, is that they, uh, the, the forbidden love of the gay pirate story is, uh, has to face this technical limitation of the system that won't represent it. So it, it kind of adds to this, they kind of had to figure out a way to lean into that uh, forbidden love aspect. Um, which is interesting, but of, obviously we don't want to uh, glaze over the problematic element of what is not able to be represented by these tools. Um, a much more uh, fun and delightful project uh, is Chris Glab's um, uh, series of photo collages. Uh, and these are um, really kind of just uh, really represent that artistic experimentation, uh, just open ended. Uh, engagement with the system. So what Chris ended up doing is using DALI, um, these actually large um, images, they are meant to be projected sort of um, by sort of three, four meters um, by six meters. Uh, so large projections, uh, but they're just still images and they're really actually singular in uh, sing kind of singular outputs from uh, from DALI. And so the he was trying to develop prompting systems that told the, the, the system to keep expanding the image, 
but the image, uh, the system itself created the collage. So he hasn't collaged together um, any items, but kept trying to like develop techniques to make it collage together different aesthetics, uh, making this very chaotic, like uh, basically drinking uh, from a fire hose of the internet uh, kind of aesthetic feel to them. Uh, they're very nonsensical um, uh, and sort of really, really fascinating. And it took us all along. It really does feel like collage, uh, like, but there is no sort of post-production. It's all an extension of the, um, of the, uh, of the system itself. Uh, on another end of that spectrum is the work of Jackson. Uh, and Jackson uh, really put together uh, a deep research project trying to, uh, for at, this, at least at the undergrad level, trying to explore and compare different representations of different mental health conditions by using um, using different. Uh, he was really interested in the comparison, say, between sort of popular internet diagnosis websites and uh, popular media. So he he made uh, using the the different language models. He was making fake patients uh, and trying to uh, create characters that would have diagnosis and feeding it large amounts of uh, information about that from the different parallels. And so making two parallel versions where there was sort of a popular media version of, of depression or uh, what have you, and then uh, another sort of one from the WebMD MD kind of ecosystem world. Uh, so he made a whole, uh, I don't have the whole, he had made a whole installation, a whole two fake, um, uh, fake medical uh, sort of diagnosis rooms with patient information that you could go across and find a desk, very large scale detailed installation that came out of this work. Um, and then uh, another work here is uh, the work of a duo, uh, Madeline Merritt and Mia. Uh, they made um, uh, a big board game uh, and this was less about the system itself, um, but uh, they were particularly interested in uh, an anti game of life or an anti life game in the sense of they hated everything about the game of life uh, and it's and it's focus on money and achievement and so they wanted to make a meandering game that had no way of winning uh, and in this case the 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 tools took a background um, to their ideas and just allowed them to iterate they had allowed them to develop uh, massive levels of production um, sort of like they made, you know, 20, 30 card characters illustrated. They printed all kinds of things. They made um, uh, different objects as well as making other like very detailed handmade objects. So this is, this project fits in this way of like, of just seeing, uh, understanding the, the sort of the craft of the tool and trying to get into the craft of the tool uh, versus trying to explore its limits and trying to break it. Uh, and this uh, final project uh, from Valérie Bélanger uh, is a, um, it's, in its original form, it was a, a fake nature documentary. Uh, so um, they used all kinds of synthetic voice generators and et cetera to make a fake documentary. But basically they um, used their own wildlife photography. So they were, um, they're a really great photographer and they took out all of their, this collection that they had of these mushrooms and then started using those as the image-based prompts to get the systems to try and morph and morph and morph. And so they kind of created, using this genre of the time-lapse, uh, created a sort of otherworldly morphing um, that they were basically having to do in, in little chunks. Uh, so this is, I think, what's particularly successful and powerful about this is um, this artist's uh, already understanding of the of photography as a discipline and their photographic lens uh, that they are then prompting the system with their own creative work to see um, what kind of otherworldly aspect they can get. Uh, so it's, uh, in the end, we have recommissioned the project actually to, for a, for a piece. Uh, here at Art Engine that will display sort of long term, uh, which is an endless looping of this sort of morphing world that they've created. Um, yeah, so that is uh, let's go back. That is a, a quick run through of some of the um, some of the projects 
uh, that we that we put together or that came out of that studio. Um, I think what was very interesting with the students is um, how quickly um, they could uh, come to a realization of the limitations of the system. You know, as is a bell curve in any uh, class or any group of people, there are a number who just accept what it is and are satisfied with it. Um, but there was definitely a lot of them who, who either had their quickly, they had the myth dispelled about them being anxious about it and realized its limitations and, you know, further understood the value of their deep engagement with materials, with uh, craft and all of these things. And then I think uh, another side just had a whole uh, other set of tools that opened up for them uh, to explore um, that they didn't feel, you know, it's a constant mix of terrifying uh, and excitement, uh, a kind of sublime experience of using these things. Um, uh, but it was overall a, a really, really rewarding uh, studio experience where um, I think that they were able to truly understand um, uh, some things about the system. For instance, like I think this is a great example, just I'll end maybe with this anecdote, where uh, I, they, we were talking about you know, the AI's ability to you know, not do walking properly in the videos or, and ha have its trouble with hands and feet. And one of the things that they were able to understand a bit more was that they're, they're, they're trained on a camera. They understand how a camera works and as a, as a tool, um, but that the machine itself is trained on the images of the camera and actually doesn't have an understanding of the camera's perception. And as artists, they were, e they were able to see the sort of meta layer of the system um, because they can understand how the craft of photography works, uh, especially in our school, they start with analog photography, so they have a really uh, detailed understanding of that. Uh, so it became a really interesting way for them to understand how this, or get some insight into how the system was generating images, certainly not at any advanced technical level in terms of the actual models themselves, but as a conceptual understanding to then go further. Because I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a moment where, um, where photography is uh, become unhinged because of what image generation is giving. It's become unmoored uh, in the way that painting became unmoored in the, in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century by photography. This technology, I think, is doing that similar thing. Uh, and the artists are meeting this sort of exciting and unstable moment with that kind of approach. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs>